Hi, everyone. Yeah, thanks for taking the time to join the meeting today. Uh, yeah, so uh, today we'll be presenting at Peaks Online and uh, some, of, some of the features that are built into it for automation as well as for de novo sequencing and everything in Peaks that's related to uh, working with uh, DIA data. Yeah, so if you have any questions throughout the um, meeting, um, so so my name in the meeting is, is Dan, and you could send any of your uh, questions to me uh, throughout the meeting at, in the chat window, and I'll answer them at, at the end. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, but feel free to ask me uh, questions at any time. So what I'm going to be going over today is giving you an, an outline of Peaks Online and what it is and how it's different from what most people know uh, about Peaks, which is Peaks Studio. And I'll be taking you through our automated search option, which actually gives you the ability to launch searches directly from your instrument by using the instrument daemon. As well as then I'll be taking you through the features that are related to um, DIA, such as a spectral library search, a protein identification using our direct database search, de novo sequencing and label-free quantification, and some of the new algorithms that we have built into the software that are related to that. And then at the end, I'll be talking about um, the use of DIA data for immunopeptidomics, uh, which with a new feature that we'll be releasing soon, which allows you to build a spectral library using uh, database search results as well as the NOVA only data. And so what are the advantages of Peaks Online? So uh, Peaks Online is, is very fast, it's automatable, and it's easy to use for high throughput proteomics. So we try to limit the amount of button clicks that you have to do with Peaks Online. And it's also great for having multiple users that are able to search jobs on a single computer. So the, the framework of Peaks Online is this. So people are able to send jobs to uh, their Peaks server through a web interface, through Chrome, through Firefox, any, any web browser, you're able to send jobs to Peaks through that server. And even your instrument is able to send jobs to the server automatically. And what that then does is then distributes those jobs to some worker nodes, which do the main work, the de novo sequencing database search quantification. And it's distributed to a Cassandra databases in order to store that data um, as it's working through um, the algorithms. Once the job's complete, it then sends the results back to the master node, which then shares, the, shares those results with uh, the users through a web interface. So the end result of this is a, a, a very fast way of, of running the software. So I'll give you some examples. So what we have here is a, is a fairly small data set. So it's uh, three um, DIA runs that we created some libraries with, with three uh, of the same DDA runs. These are just um, uh, three times 160 minute runs. So three, uh, three hour runs. And, and what we're then doing is doing um, a library search, which for those runs it only takes 12 minutes. But then if you're going to then use a library search plus database search, it's able to finish that in about an hour. And then if you then add on de novo sequencing, it, to that as well, it's able to finish that job in about an hour and a half. So the, the end result is that it's able to finish jobs uh, even faster than that it's able to generate the data on the instrument. The important thing about Peaks Online is that it's highly scalable. And it's good for uh, very large sets of data. So for example, we did a benchmarking uh, study with um, 672 180 minute runs and see how long that uh, Peaks is able to run through that. So, so in total that we're then looking at about uh, 
uh, 30, 30 million MSMS scans here. Uh, so if you're then doing that on a 32 thread uh, computer, it's able to do that in uh, 230 hours. But then as you add more cores to that uh, Peaks Online server, it, if you get, then get up to uh, 512 uh, cores, it's then able to complete that very large set of data in less than a day, so at 17 hours. And so the important thing is that it scales linearly with the hardware that you give it. Yeah, so uh, Peaks Online is designed to uh, work with uh, in a in a high throughput environment. So so you give it a, a lot of hardware, um, and it's able to uh, chug through that data as quickly as possible. But one of the problems when you start to work with a large amount of data is that you then need to start automating your processes in order to cut down on the amount of actual um, human time that's put into actually um, running the software. So one of the solutions that we have to this is the instrument daemon or re instrument monitor. What this does is it uh, actually connects directly to your instrument and gives you the ability to start jobs as they come off the mass spec. So for example, here, it looks at a certain folder and tells if, if new raw files are coming to it. And you can configure it to look for certain details of the raw file names. So for example, you can get the sample name, uh, project name, and even the enzyme and activation mode from the actual data file. And then you can tell it how many samples to wait for in order to actually start a, a mass, but to start a peaks run. And then one, once it, in this case, sees say six mass spec files, it will then start a new job. And you can set this overnight, and then hopefully in the morning, you'll come back to some, some peaks results as well. Um, if um, you want to go a different way, and we also have Peaks Online where, where you can set it up to work in a command line interface, where you can set it up to work in a pipeline um, in order to accept jobs uh, that way. Great. Um, so one of the reasons why we need um, to have a, a tool such as Peaks Online is that the recent increase in complexity of mass spec data, such as uh, with DIA data files. Yeah, so just some background about DIA. Um, so uh, DDA data sets uh, tend to be biased towards the more intense signal coming off the mass spec instrument because you're actually just uh, selecting signal for fragmentation. It tends to be biased towards the more intense signal coming off the instrument. The hope from DIA data is that it's unbiased because it's looking at uh, mass windows instead of individual peptides, it should then let you see the signal coming off the less intense MS signal uh, from, from the instrument. And the idea is that it should be more reproducible, uh, better for quantification, and help you find uh, less intense uh, peptides. But it also pre pre presents a computational problem for, for peaks in that you actually get multiplex spectra meaning you have multiple peptides per spectrum, um, which makes it harder to de novo sequence and of course to identify uh, peptides from those spectra because you just have more peaks to try to pick through. Uh, there's a couple different approaches to try to deal with this. Uh, one approach is to use a, a spectral library. In that case, you're usually generating um, some uh, spectra in order to match up to your DIA data. So, so usually that's generated from a, a fractionated DDA data set. And then you search the, the DIA data set using the spectra library. And the idea there is to limit the, the size of the search space to only um, detectable peptides from uh, the MSMS spectra. Or in order to limit the bias of that, you can, all, you can create a library from a database and then search it that way, which we call um, pro protein identification, uh, direct protein identification for DIA data. So what Peaks does actually, is it actually combines these different approaches into a workflow. And I'll just take you through this real quick. Uh, so 
what you do is you feed your DI data into Peaks. You do a library search, which is uh, the, the search with the small search space. And then you accept results using a false discovery rate threshold. If it does pass your false discovery rate, you add those to your results as library peptides. All the rest of the spectra then pass forward to the database search. And then we search with the even larger search space and a smaller set of spectra in order to maximize the, the efficiency and the amount of time that it takes to use peaks and then run that. And if you have peptides from the database search, we add those to the results. And then the rest of the results, we then bring forward to de novo sequencing, which has the largest search, search space, including all the different possible peptides um, in existence. So yeah, then we search for de novo sequencing results and then uh, check the accuracy of those and include those as identification results. And then run quantification on um, those results. Yeah, so just a little bit of background about our approach to um, spectral library search, as well as uh, the other algorithms in Peaks. Um, so spectral library searches can usually be broken down into two different groups. So there's a peptide-centric and spectrum-centric um, library searches. Peptide-centric approaches start from the library and then search for signal that matches up to something from the library in the DIA data. Spectrum-centric approaches start with feature detection of um, peptides from the actual data set and then look for entries in the library. Uh, Peaks is able to do both of these um, and in tandem and then come to identification results using what we call a bi-directional search approach where we uh, do a peptide-centric and a spectrum-centric approach and then uh, find identifications that way. And by doing this method, we, we find that it's, it's a more sensitive and accurate approach, where if you look at a, our performance using um, a, a, a two species a library method, where we have a, a human data set and the, we search the human, as well as a very different uh, species, we're able to uh, maximize our accuracy and sensitivity Using out of this data set I'm from uh, a PRG study in 2018. Yeah, so uh, another approach, if you're doing a, a direct, in order to limit the uh, bias towards peptides that have already been identified in DDA data sets um, that you inherently have with a library search, uh, people often want to exclude using a library. Uh, so we also have a direct database search of DI data. But the problem with um, a direct database search of DI data is that it takes a, a significant amount of time because you have to create um, a library yeah, using machine learning from the actual, um, the actual protein database. So you basically take a proteome and create um, an in silico library from it and then search the data that way. But the, what you then end up getting is increased sensitivity of, of your results uh, by a significant margin that I'll, I'll show you in, in some slides coming up. Uh, this, we also use a, a bi-directional approach for this as well. So we have a peptide-centric approach where we start from a protein database, do a peptide prediction, uh, from the in silico database, and then we try to find entries in the, that match up to the in silico library in your DI data. And then as well, we have a spectrum centric approach where we do uh, the feature detection and then try to find entries in the in silico library that way, um, and then make identifications that way and use the two approaches to cross validate each other. As well, we also have de novo sequencing uh, for DIA data. And this was uh, developed with our uh, deep novo DIA uh, method, which is published in this uh, nature methods paper here. So basically what this does is it looks at a traditional method of using de novo sequencing or the PEAKS method of using de novo sequencing 
but um, using um, deep learning and also looking at the novel aspects of DIA data, such as the fact that you're taking multiple scans of the fragment ions. So you can look at the elution profile of the fragment ions, as well as the precursor ions, as well as uh, consider ion mobility uh, details as well. And the result of this is that you're able to get accurate de novo sequencing, even using a multiplex DIA spectra. And I'll show some of the advantages of this at the end. All right, so that's just a little bit of background about some of the algorithms that are built into uh, Peaks Online. Let's take a look at a, at a real example here. So here we have um, uh, working with a data set from uh, this publication here, where it's a, a, a very a, a type of experiment that's becoming very common to actually uh, benchmark. Uh, identification and quantification software, which is to use uh, three proteomes in two different conditions. So we have three times three technical replicates, so nine total replicates of one condition where we have a uh, yeast and E. coli in one um, amount. And then we have yeast and E. coli in a different um, amount in um, a second condition. So what we have is that the yeast should be half as much in condition B, and the E. coli should be uh, four times as much in condition B, and the human should remain the same. So then the idea is that we're, we're trying to see how we're able to separate the, the quantification results for those uh, three different proteomes and recreate the actual expected ratio. So what we do is what was done with in that paper is that they um, use the or Arbitrap QE to create some DDA data in order to create a spectral library and feed that into a library search of DIA data. And then we do the Peaks DIA workflow on that and get some quantification results. So how did we perform with this? And, and what, what can we learn about um, how DIA, how, how uh, using um, a DIA proteomics approach is helpful? Um, so one of the things that you learn from this is that it's highly reproducible. So if you look at the reproducibility across three of the te technical replicates at a, at a 0.1 um, FDR, you're able to see that we're able to get uh, over 90% reproducibility of protein identifications um, across that uh, three technical replicates in a very complex proteome. Um, and also, we're able to get very sensitive results. So if we look at just the spectral library search, we're able to identify just under uh, 4,000 human proteins. But then if we do that in a DIA workflow, we're able to identify almost 6,000 human proteins, as well as also identifying a significant uh, number of yeast proteins, as well as E. coli proteins. And you can see that we do have a significant jump in the number of identifications by using a library search and a direct database search in a workflow. Then if you look at the, the quantitative results, um, this, this is a figure from a publication uh, looking from the DDA data and how well we're able to separate the uh, three proteomes. So in our case here, the E. coli will be the, the pinkish color over here on the right. The human will be the green and the yeast will be the blue. So you can see here um, that we're able to accurately get the expected ratios. And of course, you always see this case where, where you increase your accuracy as you go up in the average area. And, it, and you can see that with DIA data, we're able to accurately separate out um, with a very minimal amount of overlap, um, the three proteomes at, with the three expected uh, conditions here. Yeah, um, so now, um, with, with just putting that example aside, and I'm gonna look at uh, um, some aminopeptidomics data. That's just a little bit of background for any of you like me who are, are fairly new to aminopeptidomics. Uh, what we're actually looking at here is we're looking at the, the presentation of uh, HLA or uh, peptides 
by MHC protein complexes. So I'm just showing the MHC1 pathway here, just as an example, just to, to show you what we're trying to do here. So basically what we're trying to look at is we're trying to look at the peptides that are presented by these MHC complexes on the surface um, in order for the um, immune system to look at these peptides for a, an immune response from, from T cells. Um, but the important thing when it comes down to the software level is what we're looking at is we're looking for undigested peptides where we don't know where um, the protein is going to be cleaved. So it's just a, a no enzyme search, um, a very, very complex data set. I'm trying to find these um, peptides being presented by the MHC complexes. So um, how do we use uh, Peaks Online for an immunopeptidomics workflow? And so we're looking at um, some pub publicly available data where they created a SPECTA library from tens of immunopeptidomic samples where they do some D DDA runs of those. I create a SPECTA library. So this is a, a big, so, so it's not a project specific library. It's a, it's a large uh, SPECTA library of many immunopeptidomic samples. And then we take like a single immunopeptidomics sample set, we do a DIA approach to that. And then we fire in our spectral library and our immunopeptidomic sample into our DIA workflow, then kick those results out to a tool such as like MHC PAN, NET and MHC PAN, in order to uh, see if we're actually getting some peptides that are able to bind to their expected MHC alleles. So in this approach, and um, it's important to know uh, one concept in PEAKS that is, is fairly unique to PEAKS, which is uh, de novo only peptides. And so de novo only peptides are spectra that don't have a good match in the database, but have a good quality de novo result. And they'll appear in any of your de novo result and any of your PEAKS results is this de novo only tab. So these results here don't have any matching entries in the protein or the pep in in the protein database. So how this relates to immunopeptidomics is these could possibly be a non-canonical uh, uh, peptides that we find in our immunopeptidomic samples. So we need a way to search these without using a database. So what we have are proposing here is a combination of a de novo sequencing and PeaksDB library. So for the DDA data, we do a typical de novo sequencing followed by PeaksDB approach, uh, collect our identifications that are within a 1% within a PSM false discovery rate, and then take what's left of our de novo sequencing results that's above um, a certain PSM filter, um, certain average local confidence filter. In this case, we're accepting lots of peptides. Um, this is a, a control by you. Um, in this case, we're just trying to collect as many a good quality de novo sequencing results as possible. And the result is that we then end up getting a much larger spectral library. We have over 130,000 peptides with, with the addition of our extra uh, de novo sequencing peptides. And the result of this, uh, looking at um, a certain, uh, certain alleles of uh, a, a JYB cell line results in this uh, publication here. You can see here that we're able to identify a, a large number of uh, predicted binders. Uh, so this is the end result here where we ran the results through peaks, put it into MHC pan and find the peptides that have a strong a likelihood of being able to bind to our MHC um, complexes in these cases. In this case, we're able to identify for the HLAB here um, over uh, 10,000 possible binders and uh, almost 8,000 uh, from uh, HLA and um, almost 6,000 for HLAC. And also getting some uh, significant increase in the number of possible binders from including our uh, de novo library here. Uh, yeah, I had a question come in here. Um, yeah, 
Wow, I'll, I'll go over that at the end. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the end result here, the, we then fire these into um, uh, software, which then predicts the actual um, binding region of these um, predicted binders here. We, we then see that we have a, a certain trend in, in the motif of these uh, predicted binders for the HLAE, HLAB, which matched up nicely um, to the expected um, binding uh, motifs of these certain alleles that we search for in this case. Yeah, so that's pretty much it for um, the actual slides in this. I'd just like to thank our, our Peaks Online team and our, our, uh, our scientific board for all their work on, on this project. And now I'd like to jump into the actual uh, software overview. So this is Peaks Online. Let's go to the home page here. So this this is what you'll see when you when you start up a, a Peaks Online instance. So you see here that it's all presented in Chrome, and the idea behind Peaks Online is that it's it's able. We have a public Peaks Online server for for demo purposes, but the idea is that you have your own copy of Peaks Online that you keep on your local area network that you can send jobs through to through a web interface. And then you can just create jobs in it. Um, actually, sorry, uh, before I do that, I'm actually gonna take a look at so, some existing results here. So here we have from our quanti quantification experiment example. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at this um, DIA workflow example where we're generating a library uh, for uh, in order to get some quantitative results with our, our three proteome standards. And we, we're trying to generate a library in order to search some DIA data. So what you can do in Peaks is that whenever you create um, some identification results from DDA data, you can then create a library from it. Um, the results in Peaks Online look very similar to what you'd expect of Peak Studio, where you have your protein tab, where you can see all the identification results. And when you're setting up the search, you actually specify some param your FDR parameters. So this is an important point when creating a library is that the library will then follow your identification parameters. So when you're setting up a search, you could set, say a 1% a PSM FDR, and then all the results will then follow that. And then in order to create a library from these results, you go to settings, inspect your libraries, click the add library button, and then all of the results that can be created into Spectre libraries will appear here. So you can add, click this result here, grab your result, add it to the right. And then you have the option to create a library from this. So remembering back to our aminopeptidomics example, you can create a library with um, de novo only results. So you can set the ALC threshold that you need in order to include um, a de novo result in the library. I suggest something in the range of 70 to 85% uh, percent ALC cutoff. Click start. we will start to add that library to your list of possible libraries here. All right, so now let's go over how to actually create a result for this. So you go to home, click create new project, Give it a name. And an important point here uh, in terms of ease of use, you could create workflows that you can then use later on. So, so for example, I, I created a predetermined workflow here for Orbitrap DA quantification. You can click that, and then it will basically fill in all the parameters for you from that point on. I'm not going to do this here. I'm just going to say create workflow so we could talk a little bit about some of the parameters. 
then you can go next. And then uh, with Peaks Online, it's best to set up a remote repository where, where you store all your data. So in this case, it, it will connect to where your data is and you can start to load your data here. So here I have our DIA data from our condition A and condition B of our nine, nine replicates of condition A, nine replicates of condition B. So we've got a lot of data that we need to load. Um, in order to make this easy to do, you can select all the data, click this fourth option, which is say create new samples by regex, and then it'll actually allow you to create sample names based on um, the data. So this is kind of cool. So what you could do is you could actually click the underscore button here, and then you could pick aspects of the file name. So in this case, we're using the condition and the condition number or condition letter, and then the, the, the replicate number here. And it'll actually then create, click upload, and it will, based on the file name, it will then create sample names for each of the sample based on that. So you can group samples that are say um, uh, with an fractionated sample based on that. But since each, based on those regex settings, each of these samples has a unique file name, we then create a set of 18 data files. And then tell Peaks the instrument type. So we're using Orbi Orbi in this case, DIA data with HCD fragmentation and uh, Triptych Digest. Click next. And then it will uh, bring you to this place where you can choose which uh, workflow that you'd like to do. You go to identification here to do library search, database search, and de novo sequencing, or I could do the quantification workflow, which will do library search, database search, and quantification, which is what I'm going to select here. And then you could uh, select your parameters. So here, uh, do the precursor fragment error tolerance. It'll actually now optimize the error tolerance based on the data in order to uh, pick the error tolerance that best suits. Um, your data set, and then you can pick one of your pre-existing uh, libraries here. And then I'll uh, pick your database for uh, protein inference. And then I uh, click this button to also do a database search. In this case, this will uh, do that in silico uh, creation of a, of a spectral library in order to also um, not just search your spectral library, but all the different possible peptides that can occur within the, the protein sequence database. Yeah, and one of the things that's new about this in comparison to uh, Peak Studio is that you have the ability to set your FDR thresholds and protein. Uh, at the peptide level and the protein level uh, beforehand so that the results will then be automatically filtered in the end result. And set up your quantification parameters. You could also do this by regex by clicking select all. I click this button here and then you can then I create conditions. So in this case, we have two conditions. So we wanna select condition A and it will then group anything that's condition A and condition B into two groups. So now we have all our data files that are from condition A put together, all our files from condition B that are put together here. Yeah, and then you could also set up some uh, protein, the, the same thing that you would have in, in Peak Studio, where you could set some peptide filters in terms of area, quality score, a number of identifications, number of uh, peptide features, as well as choose peptides based on whether or not they have a, the same uh, coefficient of variation or similar within a certain uh, threshold, and also choose whether or not to see proteins based on um, their significance, as well as normalization approach. So in this case, um, the default is to use a TIC or it can turn that off. In this case, we probably will want to normalize after the fact using uh, only human proteins. And I'll actually, I'll go into that in a little detail when we get into the results. Yeah, so once you do that, click submit and it will start to do the analysis here. 
So it will then bring you to this page where you, that you can start to see the data will load and you can uh, monitor other searches that's going through. All right, so now let's take a look at some results. So here we have the results of our um, benchmark experiment here. Take a look at how the results are actually displayed in, in peaks. Yeah, so the results will then be filtered ahead of ahead of time. So you could, th this um, summary view looks very similar to what you have in Peak Studio. We have this uh, false discovery rate curve. We can see where we're actually reaching our, our FDR cutoff here. And you can see a distribution of the, the identifications as well in this case, because with um, DIA search, we also use um, retention time prediction to help increase the accuracy of our, of our identification results, you can see the distribution of our predicted uh, retention times and the actual retention times here. And the protein result node looks very similar to what you would expect in Peak Studio. We have the, the coverage view. I click the specified sample to switch it to um, the result view that yeah, you might be uh, quite familiar with. And then this result is all completely interactive um, as we had in Peak Studio. So you can see all the peptides and how they line up to the protein. Click on any of these peptides to see the actual um, uh, predicted result. And they'll bring up this interactive view where you can see uh, the identification compared to the actual library search results. So here we have the entry in our spectral library compared to the, its matching peaks in the actual um, DAE spectrum that we're looking at. And to see the actual um, raw MSMS spectrum, you can click this button up from the top and we'll show you the actual MSMS spectrum here. So it's the precursor and fragment ion profile. And then you can see a similar thing here in the uh, peaks DB results. So the direct DB results here. Um, one of the actual useful things that we have in this result view is you could actually have a bit of a, of a, a QC details. So for example, any samples that have an identification rate that is an outlier of the total, it will then highlight those in red and say, hey, maybe, maybe this is a sample that you need to look into further uh, because it's a little bit outside of, of what we'd expect looking at all the rest of the results here in terms of the identification rate. Yeah, and the same thing here. Result view looks very similar to Peak Studio. See the, the full peptide list here. I double click on any of the peptides. And then you can see in this case here, we have the predicted um, sequence of so the in silico library here compared to our query. And you can see how that relates to the actual MSMS spectrum here. Uh, so you have some nice interactive result views um, to uh, do a little bit of a, a QA on your results. All right, so let's look, take a look at the actual quantification results. These also look very similar to what we have in Peak Studio. So you have the, the protein result table here, where you could already start to see a little bit here that we have three distributions. So we have our human, our yeast, and our E. coli here. And then you can click up here in the top. Let's say we want to look at our yeast proteins. And you can nicely see. Um, just the yeast proteins and how they're filtered out uh, of the full results here in our interactive volcano plot. And then you can see the details of the quantification. Come here to the peptide tab. You can see uh, a heat map showing the, the ratio of all of the different peptides and how they then average out to the protein level. Double click on a peptide. And you can see uh, the quantitative details specifically of that peptide here. And, and then once you take a look at your results and you're happy with what you, you're, you're looking at, uh, basically 
you could just jump straight to the export table without even looking at any of those result views. And then you could then export out your protein, peptide identification, uh, quantification tables here and click download. I can even create a, a result that's specific to each individual sample. And I think that that's, that's all that I ha had to talk about today. Yeah, thank you all again for taking the time to join the meeting.